Thanks very much. And this is just a bit of a promotional slide here, if you will, but I did want to highlight that we are very proud sponsors of the 100 Inspirational Women in Mining, which did launch this week. So then into the metals and mining price side of things. And it's been a pretty tumultuous year for metals prices. At the start of the year, we already had fairly low inventory cover. And then we had, of course, Russia invasion of Ukraine, which generated a lot of fears around supply scarcity, which drove many of the base metals and the precious metals too to record highs. Now, since then, some of those fears around supply scarcity have potentially abated a little bit as we've had some of that material finding home elsewhere. But also we've had a number of other factors weighing on prices. We have China's ailing property sector, which they've continued to struggle to get going. We've had a, a very fast rate hiking cycle, one of the fastest in the past sort of half century. And we also, of course, have broader macro headwinds in the rest of the world, too. So we've seen this sort of whipsaw from very high price, prices to prices coming down. Now, interestingly, over the past couple of weeks, we've seen that China has made a more aggressive stance towards pushing pro property stimulus to get things moving again. And really, they've taken some of the onus away from the local governments, which were spread incredibly thin. You know, they were try trying to strive for zero COVID. They were being at the same time investigated for anti-corruption. And they were also trying to push, uh, you know, improve employment, particularly amongst the youth unemployment level. And really, they were spread too thinly. They weren't able to get the property, property market moving. At the same time, while they were faced with incredibly declining land sales revenue. So then how does the picture in China look at the moment? And the data that we had for October was relatively mixed. We had retail sales in contractionary territory and missing expectations. We had fixed asset investment easing to below 6% year over year, year to date. But there are little pockets to reasons to be optimistic. Industrial production, yes, it has come down a little bit from where it was in September, but it's still up 5% year over year. This is good news for base metal demand. Rest of the world, though, we are seeing those headwinds mount. And this is why we're baking in an industrial production recession in H1 in the world X China. And this is expected to weigh on metal prices. We could see... European metal demand for the base metals being down 10% year over year in H1, if not more. And this picture has changed pretty dramatically in a very short space of time. Post-pandemic, much of the recovery has been driven by the world ex-China, as China has continued to struggle to get their economy moving again. Up until the middle of this year, the majority of manufacturing PMIs, as we can see on the left-hand chart, or your right hand, we're in positive territory. Last month though, these flipped and flipped over recent months and now the majority are in contractionary territory. We are seeing evidence that those headwinds are starting to mount. So why then hasn't demand been weaker? Why haven't some of the other sort of macro indicators been weaker? And I'm just gonna talk through a couple of reasons on this slide. One of them is the excess savings of households through much of the pandemic. And this has come down, as we can see on this chart, but it's come down from very elevated levels. Even if we take US, for example, in autumn last year, excess savings have ballooned to 2.4 trillion in the US. They've come down now to sit around 1.9 trillion, but our economics team in-house expect that this should be sufficient to sustain suspending for at least another year. And that's despite the inflationary environment we're in. What else do we have then? Well, wage growth is still remaining very strong. And really, this is one of the reasons which is continuing to underpin price increases. And until wage growth slows materially, we don't expect the Fed to ease up on policy tightening permanently. And we don't expect inflation to come down to that 2% target. You know, the October print for the US inflation was cause for optimism. And there's good reason for that. We can see that there's evidence of goods inflation at least starting to climb down the mountain. However, some of that baton has been passed to services inflation, whether it be medical care costs, education or shelter costs too, which is still galloping along. Interesting though, it's what happens next and how this picture evolves into the future. 
And in our view, again, we need to see that wage growth slowing in order to alter this picture materially, in order for some of that higher interest rate environment really to start to curtail demand. There is evidence, though, as we can see from that goods inflation, that consumers are starting to push back against higher price increases. They are starting to say, that costs too much, I'm going to exit this market at this point. And also, we need to consider how strong durable goods expenditure was through much of the pandemic. People were sitting at home, they had a bit of excess savings in their bank account, they were staring at their aged white goods, and they thought, you know, this is a pretty good time to buy an upgrade, our washing machine, our fridge, whatever it might be. And now we're in the process of paying back some of that front-loaded spending, which is why we're expecting durable goods to act as a drag through much of 2023. But this again, this is another good point for inflation. This is good news for inflation. An interest rate sensitive market, the US housing market, the impact of higher rates, what it's done is it's naturally weighed on the housing market. And this is exactly what higher interest rates are designed to do. It's designed to pull down demand. And there's signs that the US housing market is weakening and more broadly, in sort of the developed world, we're seeing sort of signs, particularly in the UK at least, we're teetering on that edge of the housing market weakening. In the US, we had home sales decline for the ninth consecutive month. We've got building sentiment at the lowest level for over 10 years. We've got construction of single family homes at the lowest level since the onset of the pandemic. These are real factors which are showing that we are starting to see weakness in the housing market. I think for me, one of the interesting takeaways of this though, is how the housing market not only has a first order impact on metals demand, it's some of those second order impacts. How much does this play into the consumer psyche? Are you going to be going out there and purchasing a new car if your housing price is falling, which represents a significant portion of your wealth? Are you going to be going on that luxury holiday next year if your uncertainty around how the housing market is paying out? Potentially not, you potentially might put a pause and see how things play out. Ultimately, it forms a bit of a self-perpetuate, self-fulfilling cycle into declining sort of consumer spending more broadly outside of the housing market itself. Again, though, good news for inflation. Another good point for inflation is that supply chain pressures are easing. But as we can see from this chart, particularly if we look at the European energy market, you know, they've come down from around half of where they sort of the European gas index was at its peak this year. But that's still up over 70 percent year over year from where we were at LME week 2021. And I think that's the important thing. Now, some of the year on year comparables for inflation are starting to look better, but these prices still remain elevated. We expect these high energy prices to continue to curtail smelting output in Europe, but also weigh on industries outside of the smelting industry as well, weigh, weigh on some of those industrial producers that are energy intensive. It's also going to weigh on some of the miners as well. And I think something to, in to interesting to consider here is how much of the inflation from higher spot energy prices has maybe already thrown through into miners and smelters. A number of these miners, a number of these smelters hedge a portion of their energy supply going forward. A number of them have long-term power agreements. However, as some of these power agreements, power contracts roll over into a still higher inflationary environment, how much could we see that further cost inflationary, cost inflationary pressures sustain into the outlook? And we can see that on the global supply chains pressure index. It's come down, it's retraced significantly, but it still maintains high, particularly when you look at sort of more historical norms. You know, we maybe we see the year on year comparisons come down when it comes to inflation. But we are still in a high inflationary environment that is going to continue to weigh on the economic growth. So why then with these demand headwinds or when might we see further supply cuts? When in our view here, I think it's important to consider inventory levels. And on this chart here on the left hand side is exchange inventories. And they've come down broadly across the base metals this year. They've come down from already relatively low le levels. If we look at markets such as copper, such as nickel, such as zinc, we're now at critically low levels of exchange inventories. So even if demand is weaker than our expectations, 
we could see room for those inventories to replenish to more historical norms before we need to see a significant retracement in commodity prices. Now, of course, when we talk about inventories, the debate undoubtedly rages on around, you know, how much inventory is sitting off exchange, how much inventory is sitting hidden to the market that we can't see. And anyone who tells you that they have absolutely certainty how much is out there is lying to you. We simply don't know. It's modeled through historical trend analysis going back sort of 20, 30, 40 years and sort of moving with our annual metal deficits and surpluses. So then where are we sitting at the moment? Well, I think it's generally accepted that end consumers are sitting on higher levels of inventory at the moment. That's because purchasing managers are more nervous around maintaining operational continuity versus paying a premium for raw material. The world has moved from a just-in-time model, whereby you can pick up the phone when you need something and get it delivered immediately, whether it be raw materials, whether it be spare parts, whatever it might be, to a just-in-case model. And we don't see that going away anytime soon, which is why we expect to see this sort of premium being built in because purchasing managers are going to want to sit on these higher levels of inventory. Secondly then, we still have prices in the main sitting comfortably above cost curves. We're not at the levels yet where we would expect to see supply curtailments, particularly from a mine perspective. The only cost curve really where we've got the price biting into the cost curve is the aluminium smelting curve. And it's biting in pretty aggressively, which is why you know, we may well see smelter curtailments into China more so than we have already, and potentially more to come in Europe as well. But essentially, we don't see room, or don't see the need for prices to retrace aggressively, as maybe some people might think, particularly as we enter maybe a recessionary scenario, because of these sort of low levels, because of this scarcity factor at play. Now, China demand this year has been weaker for uh, almost all of the industrial metals. Notably, though, China demand for copper has been very strong and it's exceeded our expectations where we were at the tail end of last year. Now, that seems a little bit perplexing. We've had, you know, of course, we've had the very negative China property market numbers, which we'll talk on in a little bit. We also have had continued sort of rolling lockdowns as well, continuing to curtail growth in China. So why has copper demand held up so strongly? And also, almost you could ask, why haven't some of the other industrial metals performed even worse than they have here? Well, as many of you might know who follow the Chinese economy closely or potentially some of our research, we look quite often at these monthly real estate figures coming from China. And this year, they've been miserable. New starts, even in October, are still down 35% year over year. In September, they were down 45% over year on year. The only sort of positive story coming out of this chart really is that completion, completions have improved. They're now sitting around 9% down year over year, and they've come from sort of the steep nadir of around sort of 35% down year over year. This is not positive, of course, for the property sector and broader metals demand. If we look on this other chart here, we've got the net increase of outstanding medium and long-term household loans. And the majority of these are made up of mortgages. And again, they've been incredibly weak this year. In the month of October alone, they were 10% of what we would normally expect in any given month. So why then has copper demand and industrial demand, metal demand not been weaker? Well, if we look at the NBS quarterly numbers, which cover a more all-encompassing construction measure, they've actually held up pretty well, pretty remarkably well. What feeds into that construction index? We have things like spending on schools, on hospitals, on factories, and importantly, on social housing. All of those factors feed pretty importantly into Xi's shared prosperity agenda. Essentially, some of that real estate weakness has been offset by that non-real estate construction spend. Into 2023, and with the policy stimulus which we've seen over recent weeks, there are now 16 discrete policy stimulus targeted towards the property sector in China. But it's much different than the property stimulus that we've seen in the past. They aren't just allowing all of the property developers to re-leverage up to their eyeballs immediately and just really chase growth again. 
Why can't they do that? Because land sales revenue is down sort of around 60, 70% year over year. And that feeds hugely in to whether they can afford to you know, go after new starts again. So we expect to see the policy stimulus continue to be targeted at the completions. If they don't, consumer sentiment towards the housing sector in China is going to continue to weaken. The Chinese housing sector has been propped up by the pre-sales model for almost the past two decades, where even this year alone, 85% of housing sales were pre-completion. What's the issue with that? When property developers are distressed with debt, high debt levels and can't service their debt, they're not completing homes. You're paying a mortgage on a house and you're not sure if your home is going to be built. That means that we're seeing a more structural slowdown in the property sector in China rather than sort of a more transitory blip. Also why we see this as more structural is because China is facing dem demographic headwinds. Their fertility rate now has dropped to almost one. That's incredibly low levels at a time where, you know, in the past we've seen this very explosive growth in the property sector. Also on top of that, as I mentioned, we have these property developers that are heavily indebted. And the ones that ultimately can't service their debt obligations are probably going to be brought under SOEs. And that spending is going to go into social housing as opposed to the private real estate sector. So then that's why maybe industrial metal demand has held up a little better. But why copper specifically? Why has copper demand been so strong? I'd like to draw your attention here to this left-hand chart. EV sales year to date in China up over 100% year over year, copper intensive sector. As I mentioned earlier, fixed asset investment more broadly eased in October. It's up less than 6% year over year now, year to date. If we look at fixed asset investment in power, however, the copper intensive side of things up 18% year over year, year to date. Essentially, Despite the headwinds China have faced, they've continued to invest in the energy transition, which is bullish story for copper and other energy transition metals as well. Just a quick one then on the, on the right hand chart. This shows the supply exposed to potential power curtailments, both in Europe and also some of the provinces in China, which are experiencing drought issues. And really in China and Yunnan and Sichuan, we haven't seen hydropower levels return to what we saw last year. You know, we're down almost 20% year over year and we haven't seen those hydro levels replenish at all, even despite, you know, the rains that we've seen over the past sort of month, six weeks. It's not surprising maybe on this chart that zinc is arguably tops the list when it comes to the metal most exposed to some of these potential power curtailments. And particularly when we look at Europe, and then you can think about, you know, some of the announcements we've seen, you know, around smelter curtailments, whether it be Port of Esme, whether it be Bedell. And on that note, thinking about how quickly European energy situation has changed from the earlier slide, you know, we've seen Trafigura announce that they're going to be bringing Bedell back online, albeit at a reduced capacity. And I think it's important to bear in mind when you're starting to think around when could we see some of this smelting capacity return, it's important to consider the energy side of the equation and how quickly that's changing. For us, though, you know, this energy side of things isn't to be ruled out. Yes, we've had some milder weather, particularly in Europe coming into winter. Also, our gas inventories have been replenished. So at the moment, at least, we are in a relatively good situation. It doesn't, even if we saw sort of a bit of a cold snap, we could see inventories drawn down. However, into next year, are we going to get the same problem again? This year, we had eight to nine months, albeit, you know, at a reduced rate of gas, Russian gas imports into the European bloc. Next year, we're not gonna be have that. So actually replenishing gas inventories potentially next summer into next year's winter, could we be in an even more acute situation? Could we see another spike in energy prices in that environment? How many of these smelters are you going to be bringing back online, which is a costly process, if you're potentially having to be turning them back offline again when it comes around to next winter? Now, with the weakness that we've seen in the China property market this year and some of those more structural headwinds moving forward, a lot of the questions we've been getting asked by investors is can energy transition demand offset the slowdown in China property sector? And on this chart here, we just have China metals demand for copper, aluminium and steel indexed to 100 against energy transition metal demand for this year or for last year even and also 2030. And we could almost argue for copper this year, it has already offset it. For steel, however, 
it's looking incredibly challenging. That energy transition demand alone is going to be offset some of that property slowdown in that market. I think what's interesting for us is when we look at some of these demand deltas, particularly if we look at nickel, for example, this is a market going through a significant transition. We're expecting energy transition demand, essentially EV demand and energy storage demand to get up to nearly 30% by 2030 from a predominantly still stainless steel market now. For us though, when we see these sort of massive perpetual deficits in some of this market, we need to start to think around how the world is going to solve for these deficits. Is it going to be an unconstrained demand story or are we going to see potentially engineering of solutions which pick other alternative technologies? Are we going to see a move away from NCM or higher nickel densities or continually bigger batteries to potentially, okay, now we're in a world where you know, if you need a car which drives 200 kilometers, you come into a dealership, you say, you try this battery out. You know, if it doesn't work with you after a month, you come back in here, we'll see if we can retrofit some more batteries. In this world at the moment where we've got this, you know, sort of range anxiety where people aren't used to the sort of the, the grid infrastructure needed to recharge a battery, people are still nervous. People want to drive like they're a mid US Midwest farmer. They want a range of sort of 400, 500 kilometers. I don't know about many of you, but I don't drive that sort of once in maybe two, three years on the trot. I've probably only done it maybe even once in my life. So it's this case at the moment where we're, you know, higher nickel cathode chemistries, higher nickel densities, higher energy densities, bigger batteries. Is that going to continue in perpetuity or are we going to get a little bit of a reality check with some of these more unconstrained demand scenarios? One good thing that has come from this push towards energy security is the acceleration in renewable energy targets. And again, we can see China leading the way here. We actually had to plot China by provinces, as you can see in the gray bars, because otherwise it just looks a little bit ridiculous on a scale against some of the other national targets. But these have accelerated meaningfully. And we do believe that there is significant momentum behind these targets now. Why? Because energy security and an energy crisis where people are being squeezed by very high energy prices, that's a lot more powerful political narrative versus climate change. As unfortunate as that is, it's a fact. By 2030, we're expecting solar and wind renewable generation to get up to 4.8 terawatts globally. However, if some of you may have seen, IRENA published their one and a half degree scenario coming into COP27. They expect that we need 10.8 terawatts by 2030. So even on our estimates, you know, which are ambitious, we're still less than half of what we might need to maintain that sort of one and a half degree scenario. Maybe we need to think around beyond maybe some of the solar and wind to some of the other sort of cleaner renewable sort of uh, technologies such as nuclear power, which we are a big believer in. What does this geopolitical segmentation also drive? Well, it's also increased momentum towards responsible sourcing. And this chart here on the, on the left-hand side, we've got China and Russia supply for mines and smelters for some of the key commodities under our coverage. We also have developed world supply. And then in the middle, we have this rest of world supply. We have this battleground, which undoubtedly developed countries and also China are going to continue to fight over to gain security of supply. I think what's interesting for us, though, is responsible sourcing doesn't just mean green metal. And crucially, it doesn't just mean lower carbon emissions. This means independently verified value chain that upholds stringent social governance and environmental standards. We see ultimately the benchmark deliverable metal moving towards something akin to the Copermark responsible sourcing framework, where everything else or the other metal on the market ultimately trades at a discount. We see this emergence of a prime and a subprime market into the future. I think interestingly, what we then can start to consider is even if you have global metal balances for a number of these commodities, fairly balanced over the medium term, even maybe on a 10 year time frame. It's not our view, but maybe if it's your view, maybe you see a global balance, which is fairly sort of a balanced market. I think what's interesting to consider is where some of this material is gonna be coming from. 
Is it going to be China? Is it going to be Russia origin? Maybe we need to look at this sort of more fragmented balances, potentially some of these sort of Eastern and Western bloc that commodity analysts used to look at sort of 20, 30 years ago. In our view, then, it's not too surprising why we've seen auto manufacturers signing some of these longer term supply agreements to ensure that they have this security of supply, to ensure they have this security of supply, that they can be confident in the origins of where it came from. Into next year, we do see fairly adequately balanced markets. And some of this is because we are seeing demand being pulled down, particularly in developed markets, whilst we are seeing shoots or signs of optimism around you know, that China demand story. In our view, though, one of the biggest takeaways from LME Week, which has just passed, is that a number of industry consultants have over-optimistic expectations around mine supply growth, and in particular, around copper. Why, in our view, is that? Well, we think they're underestimating some of the operational challenges facing the world's largest copper producer, Kedelka, which we're not expecting it to return to sort of the levels we've seen over the past three, five years in the next sort of three, five years again, because they're facing operational challenges at a number of their assets. So then whilst we do have sort of adequately balanced markets, they might be a bit tighter than some of the other models that you may well have seen at this point in time. We also think the number of industry consultants are way too optimistic around Russian supply growth, whether it's new projects coming online and being commissioned, or whether it's even maintaining a flat operational performance at existing assets. If I'm a Russian miner and I have equipment, trucks, mill liners from rest of world suppliers, how am I going to get spare parts? How am I going to get replacement trucks in a world where no one's going to sell them to me? Am I going to have to move towards equipment, which is potentially less efficient? Am I going to have delays in sourcing that equipment from elsewhere? Is it going to be a challenge then to maintain even a flat operational outlook, despite sort of some of the sustained growth that we see in a number of these, again, these industry consultant models, particularly, again, copper, but also zinc as well, where a lot of sort of previous prior to the Russia-Ukraine war, we were expecting a lot of the mine supply growth to come from Russia. Long term, a number of these markets are in structural deficits. However, as I mentioned earlier, we don't see these massive perpetual deficits emerging in perpetuity. They simply can't. We can't have a market where supply doesn't move up and demand doesn't come down. We can't have negative inventory. We can't have these unconstrained demand scenarios. Ultimately, we need to be in a position where we see higher substitution. That means substitution pricing to incentivize that. We need to see demand thrifting. We need to see demand destruction across the board in a number of these commodities because if supply isn't going to move up because of issues through permitting, through water scarcity, through local opposition, through uncertainty around royalty structures going forward, we need to see that demand line coming down. Just to wrap up then from my side, how do we see prices moving over the next 12 months? And it's safe to say that we do see the base metals complex coming under a bit of selling pressure next year. We see the nadir in prices into Q1, as we see the typical seasonal ebb in demand, which is expected to result in that visible inventory build. And that's something which we're gonna be looking at really closely, is how those exchange inventories move, particularly through Chinese New Year. And that will give us a good indication as to how much of that off exchange, that hidden inventory can actually come back to the market. If it doesn't, you know, we could be at a lot tighter markets into next year than potentially even we are anticipating. On the pressure side of things, I think it's gonna be a really interesting year. And for us, it's something which investors have been asking us about a lot. Of course, we're a Canadian bank. We get a lot of gold questions coming in. You know, why hasn't gold done better this year despite multi-decade high inflation? Well, you could also reframe that and say, why, hasn't, why has gold done so well given that we've had such high US dollar strength? Why has the gold price done so well given that we've had one of the fastest rate high trajectories we've seen over the past 40, 50 years? And I think it's that sort of thing, that interplay that we need to start to think about when it comes to how gold prices are going to move into next year. Our economics team expect that US dollar is going to peak and start to roll over into the turn of next year. Potentially what's proven a sustained headwind to precious metal prices this year could start to prove a bit of a tailwind.
And then we could see, you know, as we approach what we expect to see at least, particularly the Fed, approaching that terminal rate in Q1, how could interest rate expectations thereafter change? How could that influence gold prices? Could we potentially see another rebound in the precious metal complex into the into sort of the end of next year? And with that, yeah, I'd like to open it up to questions if we if we have some time. Thanks. We do, yes, indeed. Awesome. Has anyone got a question? Anyone want a commodity pick? Yep, we'll start going through. Martin. Yeah, where, where do you stand on the big lithium debate, um, which is carrying on at the moment? Do you see lithium spot prices staying high for a while? Um, and when do you expect to see them kind of really start coming down? And then where do you think the steady state lithium price is going to end up that people should be putting into economic models from, say, 2027 onwards? Yeah, so we have lithium prices remaining elevated for the next couple of years, as we expect to see you know, a continual tight market. And we are also big believers in the LFP technology as well. We sort of, I think, you know, a couple of years ago, or maybe even last year, even, you know, we thought this was going to be a pro predominantly sort of China centric story around LFP. You know, we now have LFP reaching up to sort of 45 p penetration rate in sort of amongst the, you know, the cathode mix by 26, 27. So we are bullish on the on the lithium story when it comes to demand. I think at the moment for us, and for me, you know, we don't look after the lithium model internally. It's looked after by one of our AGS guys in the US. But I think what's interesting from sort of a more mining perspective or mining lens is that a lot of these supply projections are very optimistic when it comes to lithium supply, particularly at the tail end of the decade. It's almost a case of if you say your mine's coming on by 2027, the assumption is in a lot of these models that it's going to come online. So I see that the risk is that we potentially see more supply disruption flowing through than actually what people are anticipating. With regards to sort of some of that longer term price, you know, we're sort of sitting, I think, around sort of that thirty, thirty-five thousand um, dollars a ton level. So we're somewhere around there. So lower than you know what we have, but we still see a tight market even under our scenario, which might sort of, in my opinion, are potentially a little bit too ambitious on the supply side. You know, we could see some of those more project delays, and particularly, you know, as this water scarcity issue doesn't seem to be going away, you know, anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 20 to 26 percent price reduction on nickel. Yep, yep, from these levels. From current levels. Yep, yep. And I think the reason for that is nickel's been through a very tumultuous year. Part of that is through the low exchange, the critically low exchange inventories, which we've seen. Of course, we saw the sort of nickel debacle, which we saw in March of this year, um, with you know the owner of Sing Chan being squeezed out of his positions, which led to the market ballooning. You know, at the moment, we are still seeing a tight nickel market. But from our perspective, you know, this is still a stainless steel driven market at this point in time and probably still by 2030, it's still going to make up the lion's share of that story. So from, uh, you know, from where we see things, you know, these price levels are beyond what they need to be to incentivize production. But also if they maintain at these levels, you're going to see higher LFP penetration. You're also going to potentially see, you know, the likes of CATL pushing some of those sodium ion batteries and some, some of their very low end models, you know, around that sort of middle of the decade time, which, you know, again, even a year ago, 18 months ago, you asked me if we were going to see sodium ion chemistries within EVs this decade, I would have said, you know, there's a very low probability of that. Now, it seems like, you know, CATL, for example, are certainly going to push that into sort of the middle of this decade. So I think that's the thing with some of these high prices. But sure, it seems great at the moment. But what it does is incentivizes other solutions, incentivizes alternatives. We can't have these supply deficits just opening up in perpetuity. The world is full of good engineers and ultimately we do solve these problems. So for us, some of these long-term prices, really they're sort of what we see as more of a kind of an equilibrium price. And the manganese is to your left. You just stood in front of us and said you were seeing LFP chemistries, which I don't mm -hmm. believe exist. Mm -hmm in five years mm -hmm. because they will be doped or tuned or whatever with uh, either little or very high manganese content. So that story does not... So really for the LFP? Yes. So it still is a very sort of cheap alternative for some of those lower to mid-range entrants into the markets. You can boost the capacity of 20 to 30% with the manganese and that is going to change but the LFP chemistry, uh, the, the, the penetration, and for for a longer time, I can see that as a competition to the high nickel ones, but I don't see the LFP as a pure LFP battery exists in 10 years, or five for that matter. 
Yeah, and I think unless it's stationary. Yeah, yeah, and I think you you raise a couple of interesting points there, and I think. From our perspective, we will see some of these sort of supply gaps and things being solved by technological ingenuity. Some of the solutions which we're seeing now and we have good visibility on, you know, potentially they're not going to be the solution in 10 to 15 years. But it's because of some of the qualification times at auto manufacturers, you know, it's run for sort of five to six years. You know, on that time frame, we have relatively good visibility on what that battery chemistry is going to be. You know, on that time frame, it's really, you know, as you said, sort of that 2030 time frame. And from our perspective, I think, yeah, you're right. It's probably going to compete with some of those high nickel cathode chemistries as opposed to some of those, you know, LFP chemistries, which I do, I do think that they are going to be there because it's affordable. And also, if we think about that diversified global supply base as well, if we look at some of the nickel chemistries, you know, significant chunk of that is coming from China alone, but it's also coming from Chinese owned supply in Indonesia too. You know, how is that going to play into the market over the next 10 to 15 years? Oh, you know, potentially sort of a lithium, if you're thinking about securing some of your supply, you know, you can look at a, at a, a more broad sort of global picture as, as to where that comes from. Uh, just a question on your, your assumptions about green premium and things like the copper market. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of premium are you expecting driven by kind of volunt voluntary demand from, I guess, high-end consumers who are willing to actually pay a green premium? And... Are you expecting more uh, government or uh, internationally agreed rules that would actually force a green premium? Yeah, so I think from our perspective, you know, we may see the emergence of something akin to a green premium over a short space of time, but really we expect the benchmark deliverable, whether it's LME deliverable, whatever it might be, metal trending towards, you know, they have to be meeting these responsible sourcing frameworks, such as something such as the copper, and then everything else then trades at a discount. So it's a little bit different, you know, maybe it's not a premium, maybe we're looking at this sort of prime and subprime market. When you're in that sort of, you know, realm, I guess it depends on, you know, the scarcity in these markets at any given time as to how much people are going to pay for that. You know, I think it could be at least to the sort of the tune of, you know, 10 to 15%. And potentially, you know, there's gradations within that scale as well, below the market, as to how much people are willing to pay for that. But at least at this point in time, I think we see the benchmark itself trending towards, you know, those responsible sourcing frameworks, um, rather than maybe some of the, the green premium that the people are anticipating. But I do think that that means that we see more of these offtake agreements from auto manufacturers, from other industries, looking to secure their supply, whether it be, you know, from the likes of Canada, whether it be from Australia, whether it be from the US, you know, even if we've seen some of these more nationalistic policies, such as that, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act, you know, it's really trying to drive some of that domestically sourced production, some of that source production from these free trade agreement countries. And I think, you know, that's not going away anytime soon. I think it's the rest of the market which potentially falls behind a little bit. And are you, are you seeing any payment for that sourcing? Yeah, so I think you, I think you, I think you see it. Finance. I think you see it reflected through the discount. I don't think, again, I don't think it potentially gets accepted onto the exchanges, and I think then it trades at sort of, you know, just hand to mouth, um, you know, contracts, and ultimately that can trade at the discount as dictated by the market. You know, it could be, it could be ten, fifteen percent. It could be twenty five percent. You know, it really depends on on how much of the market, you know, has signed up to, you know, to delivering on on that benchmark. Is, is there any way of tracking the discounts? That are Happening in the market. So at the moment, it's very illiquid in terms of like the premiums that people are receiving. You know, there's some sort of anecdotal evidence that, um, you know, that people are receiving premiums for some of this metal, but they're not material enough. And it's it's still so illiquid that, you know, really hasn't got to a mature enough market yet to, to sort of say that this is the green premium for aluminium for, you know, this amount of you know, low carbon material. Thank you very much. Roy. Thanks.